do you think the future of our vehicles will look like? Will we drive our cars or will they drive us? Will they have two wheels or four? How will our future selves get around? Transportation in all forms will undoubtedly look much different in the next decade than it does today. But the question remains, how do we get there? Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. The future electrification of the world's transportation industry depends on the infrastructure we create today. In this episode of Chalk Talk, Sven Lurch from Worth Electronic joins me to discuss the electronic challenges and solutions for today's e-mobility designs and EV charging stations. We take a closer look at the trends in these types of designs, the role that electronic parts play in terms of robustness in this arena, and how Worth's Red Cube can help you with your next electric vehicle or EV charging station design. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about this topic from Worth Electronic. Hi, Sven. Thank you so much for joining me. Hi, Emilia. Thanks as well. It's a pleasure being here. Excellent. Okay, so we're talking about the challenges and solutions in the world of e-mobility today. But Sven, before we get started, what kind of applications are we really talking about here? We think that the market can be divided into four major segments. Light electric vehicles that you see on the very left side, having a maximum power of around 4 kilowatt and a maximum speed of around 50 kph which is 30 miles per hour. So talking about e-bikes, scooters, and so on. Electric vehicles, so everything beyond these 4 kilowatt and beyond 50 kph. Electric motorbikes, cars, buses, trucks, and so on. The necessary charging equipment. If you have an electric car, you need to charge it. So the charging equipment is the third major segment that we are seeing. So starting with the domestic wall box, And I think we will find these wall boxes in almost any household in the near future. AC charging stations for public areas, as well as DC high power charging stations. And coming up, still very slowly, but coming up, the wireless charging. And the fourth segment, well, it's not really a segment, but a collection of further interesting e-mobility applications, such as drones, robots, forklifters, and boats. Excellent. Now, Sven, I know that standards play a big role in e-mobility designs. So what kind of passive component standards especially are we looking at here? And there are automotive and non-automotive standards to keep in mind, right? Totally right. So when talking about mobility, we always talk about safety as well. So there's always a danger that people might get hurt when being mobile, and this danger has to be minimized. So for electronic components, this means that they have to work 100% reliable and in every environment and in any foreseeable usage. So there are many regulations for passive and active electronic components. But yeah, I want to point out the three most important ones for the automotive sector, which are ACQ 200 or 100 for active components, IATF 60949, and the PPEP level, in most cases, level 3. For the stationary equipment, like charging or also the light electric vehicles, we are not faced with too many regulations, but there is coming up more and more requests for the AECQ 200 qualification. That makes sense. But Sven, e-mobility is such a hot topic these days. What kind of trends in particular are you seeing in this space? We are seeing four major trends. And I think we are not the only ones that see these trends. Many market players talk about exactly these four trends. So it's electrification. It's the connection of the vehicle to the outer world. It's autonomous driving and it's shared mobility. And for sure, these four trends bring up many new challenges for the developers and for the manufacturers of those vehicles. So having a look at the electrification, people want the same product specifications that they have today with gasoline cars. So they want to have a good driving range. They want to charge as fast as they can fill up the tank of the gasoline car. And for sure, people and also the manufacturers want low emissions. Then the connected trend, basically, we are talking about three sub-trends. One is the machine-to-machine communication. 
which means that your car might communicate with the traffic lights, for example. Then the human-to-machine communication, the driver or the passenger is talking or communicating with the machine, and the machine, so the car in this case, is communicating to the driver. The autonomous trend, in this trend, sensors and actuators replace the human interaction. This is very on a high level spoken, but in the future, we will be sitting in the car without doing anything for driving, but maybe reading a book, for example. And the four major trend that is coming up is the shared mobility. So today we used to own our own car, but in the future, we will more or less only use the car. So we will not own it anymore, but use it. And for this trend, there will be much higher mileages of these cars. And so the lifetime of components must also rise very much. Okay, Sven, can we start with electric vehicles and take a closer look at them? When talking about electric vehicles, we are talking about very high voltages and high currents. Also, for this reason, they are very EMC critical. And uh, the topic of robustness is very important. So having a look at different applications in automotive, we are seeing, for example, the infotainment application. We are seeing onboard charger inverter, the high and low voltage DC-DC converter, the lighting, or that's concerned to lighting or connected to lighting, body electronics and comfort, and the overall EMC, which are major applications that electronic engineers are faced with when it comes to designing an electric vehicle. So Sven, how do you see this affecting mileage for these kinds of vehicles? Especially if you have a closer look on the shared mobility. So shared mobility is coming up. And with the shared mobility, we do not own the car anymore, as I said before, but we only use it. And if we have, I think, a quite realistic calculation on this, we see a personally owned car of today, which is roughly used 1.5 hours per day over a lifetime of maybe 15 years the car will have more or less 8,000 operating hours. Having a look at the shared vehicle, which is going to be used much more per day because people share this vehicle. It goes around the whole day picking up people, bringing them to their destination, then picks up the next passenger. And so it will have much more operating hours. And roughly calculated, we can reach easily 100,000 operating hours. Wow, okay. So... Sven, what about the inverter? Can we take a closer look at that aspect of the design? Yeah, as you know, the inverter converts the power from the battery for the electric motor. So it's a very principal application within an electric vehicle. I've very easily drawn the powertrain here. You see the traction battery on the left side, the traction inverter in the middle, and the electric motor on the right side. So when it comes to accelerating, the battery supplies the inverter with power, which converts it for the electric motor. And this is a specialty when it comes to electric mobility. The electric motor can also be used as a generator. So when braking, the motor assists this braking by generating energy. And for this, for sure, the inverter again is used to charge the battery. And um, having then a look at the operating hours, if this inverter would be built in a privately used car, it would have around 8,000 operating hours. But when looking at the shared mobility, this inverter will be in usage 18 hours a day, which results in 100,000 operating hours in total. And by this, you can already see that the electronic components on this inverter design must play this game. All right. So Sven, these kind of e-mobility applications also need to be robust, right? How do you see their electronics playing a role here? They are playing a crucial role. So as the inverter basically is a piece of electronic, the electronic parts are the major factor for high robustness. I have brought across one example of an input line filter. So when accelerating the car, there will be always current peaks. High, high acceleration values will bring high current peaks and the electronic parts must withstand these peaks. And when it comes to higher lifetime expectations, these peaks will happen more and more often. To give you a little more detail on this example, we have designed one multi-layer power suppression bead. So basically it's a ferrite bead that is especially designed for these high lifetime expectations. You can see here in the graph on the lower left side, there's a big green area that shows that the product is designed far above the common standards in the market. 
With the MPSA, we have defined very special test criteria with single pulses of up to 100 amps and multiple pulses yeah, of 100 pulses and more. And this guarantees a much higher robustness than we see in comparable parts. And this makes us quite confident that this component can withstand these demands of the market. Having a look at the inside of this product, you will find the reason for this high reliability. So the special inner silver layer is making sure that this high pulse capability is reached. Okay, so Sven, what do you guys offer in this case? It's only one component of our portfolio, but a very special one, the MPSA, as I said before, is especially designed for these robust applications or applications where the robustness is demanded. And we are seeing many happy customers using this ferrite bead for their EMC suppression. When we're talking about an automotive design in particular, there are a lot of different components to keep in mind, right? Right. You can see here in this picture that we are not talking only about EMC ferrite chokes for sure, but also about power inductors, ferrite cores, rod cores, common mode chokes. And all these components, as they are also, for example, situated on the inverter PCB or on other automotive applications, play the same important role for reaching these high robustness goals in the automotive sector. So Sven, earlier you mentioned EV charging stations. So can we dig into the details of those? Yeah, sure. So everybody who is owning an electric vehicle will need to charge this electric vehicle. So there will be a ramp up of this market. And again, same as with the electric vehicles, we see here a demand for high voltage and high current applications. Again, it's for sure EMC critical, but there's no automotive certification required, which makes the design a little more easier and the choice of components also a little more easier. Having a closer look inside such a charging station, we see, for example, the charge control unit, we see the power transmission, we see also overall EMC, we see also the residual current detection, a radio unit, and in many cases, a display or a human machine interface. All these applications within a charging station are powered or are driven by electronics. Great. Now, when it comes to these EV charging stations, how much power do they really need? They need much power. So for sure, it depends. If we have a look on domestic wall boxes, they range about 11 or maximum 22 kilowatt maybe going up to 50 kilowatt in the future, which is not that much. But when it comes to long travels, so if I want to go, for example, to my next vacation, I have a travel of 1,000 kilometers, let's say. And during this 1,000 kilometers, I will need to have one or two or maybe three charging stops to reach my destination. And I do not want to have two long charging stops. I want to charge fast. So maybe a break of 50 minutes is acceptable. And then I want to continue my journey. For reaching these short charging times, we need high charging power. And so in this case, we are talking and the whole market is talking about 350 kilowatt charging power. And if we just have a little comparison how much this is, and it's really much, I have just brought one example that we know from our household. Everybody has an oven in his household. And the oven is probably, let's say, one of the most powerful applications that we have inside our homes, and it has two kilowatt. So you can see the dimension that the charging station has much more power and calculating the current that results from this. So 350 kilowatt at 800 volt is more than 400 amps of current that we need, which is again, really much. I'm telling you this story for a special reason. These 440 amps is not too much for the VE or the WE Red Cube which is one of our very commonly used products for charging stations when it comes to the power transmission. And yeah, it transmits up to 500 amps between the PCB and the wire or between two PCBs. So it makes sure that the power that is needed arrives safely at your car. So this is the basic function of this uh, Red Cube within a charging station. So Sven, what does the Red Cube buy me as an engineer in this case? Yeah, so as we have seen, the high power charging needs a safe transmission of this high power, which goes beyond 400 amps. 
And this is exactly what guarantees our Red Cube. So we have the capability of up to 500 amps transmitting the power from the board to a wire, for example, to the charging cable or from one board to the other board. This is what engineers are definitely looking for when it comes to designing such a high power charging station. Cool. Now, what other applications is the Red Cube a good fit for? One example, let's say it's from the past. We have been driving in the Formula E with our Red Cubes. So our partner Audi Sport, Ab Scheffler, who has won yeah, several championships and many, many races, has been using the Red Cubes. And this was also for us a very good proof that this Red Cube is capable of transporting these high currents and is also capable of these rough environments. So in racing sports, you see high current peaks, you see high uh, temperature rises, high temperature changes. As far as I know, we did not see any failure of the Red Cube, which makes us very confident to also be safe in the charging stations. So Sven, can we circle back to EV charging stations? Beyond the high power handling, are there any other opportunities for designing in innovative articles? Yes, there are. So especially when it comes to public charging stations, there is always an interaction with the user needed. So when I'm driving or I'm coming to a charging station, I must do the payment, I must do the authentication. So the Bluetooth or the Wi-Fi module guarantees the authentication and the payment that the charging station knows that I'm the right user and I'm allowed to charge my vehicle. And also a nice feature for wall boxes as well. If I'm sitting at my breakfast table, maybe I want to have a look on the charging status of my car and I can do so just taking out my mobile phone and checking the charging status. For this purpose, for example, a Wi-Fi module may be very helpful for the developer. So in looking beyond the wireless connectivity options I just showed before, we are seeing many more components inside such a charging station, from capacitors to power inductors to connectors to varistors, also to shielding material. So we are seeing a real huge potential for electronic components here and a need for electronic components for sure. Okay, so Sven, you also mentioned light electrical vehicles as well. So can we take a closer look at those? Yeah, so light electric vehicles, you will find them on the streets quite commonly. For example, the electric kick scooters have been, I think the start was in San Francisco and now they are all over the world. Not everybody likes them, but they are there. The challenges for developers are especially the small volume of the small footprints that they need to realize because these vehicles are small and they need small electronics. But nevertheless, these electronics have to be powerful. So it's a relatively high current demanded. We have a high vibration exposure. So as the streets are not always perfectly, we need to be robust against uh, vibrations. And therefore, the ACQ200 is often requested by customers. And again, same as with charging stations, we do not need any automotive certification in this case. Having a closer look on the detailed application within electric vehicle, here I've taken an electric bike as an example. In most cases, you have a display or a human machine interface. You have a gearbox, which in more and more cases is also electrically driven. So it's automatic uh, shifting gearbox in many cases. We have the motor or the inverter. We have lighting and we have for sure the battery. These are the basic applications within a light electric vehicle. Excellent. Now, I also know that thermal management is a crucial design consideration with these kinds of vehicles. Yes, it is. It is a real big challenge for the developers. Yet the space for the electronics is quite small. But as I said before, the current or the power is quite high. So the temperature always goes along with power. The more power we have, the more temperature we need to get out of the system. Because unfortunately, we are not at 100% efficiency yet. And for this reason, the developer has to have a real close look on how to get out the temperature of the PCB. And there are different opportunities that he has. For example, he can use gap filling solutions that, for example, connect his CPU to a mechanical housing. He can use heat spreading solutions that just to spread the heat inside his applications. And there are hybrid solutions. But in any case, he has to get out the heat to ensure the constant power of these vehicles. So Sven, 
what kind of worth components are included in one of these light electrical vehicles? Many, many. I think the e-bike boom started 10 or 15 years ago, and we were there with the right components at that time. And so we are really very deep into that branch. And for almost everything, so charger, battery, motor, lighting, the display, we have the suitable components such as capacitors, for example, MLCCs, or also the aluminum electrolytic capacitors, power inductors, LEDs, connectors. So basically, really everything. We are a good choice. And beyond this article, as you might know, we also try to give a good engineering support to our partners that makes them easy to design in the right components. I can also show you part of our e-mobility campaign. Many people know Worth Electronic for their EMC capabilities or the EMC portfolio. And for sure, we are very strong in EMC. But uh, what I wanted to show you today is that we are also very strong in other electronic parts. And I hope I have given you a good insight in this. Thinking, for example, in the RedCube press fit or also in the wireless connectivity solutions that we have. So we are far more than EMC and very happy to support you in your future challenges. Excellent. Well, Sven, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Amelia. It was really a pleasure. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic from Worth Electronic. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. You can't miss it. It's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal.